Hello, and welcome to the Friday Harbor Film Festival of 2021. From the San Juan Islands in the Salish Sea, the traditional territory of the Strait Salish and Coast Salish people since time immemorial, and the territory of the Southern Resident Killer Whales, JK and Elf Hogs. We're in a core part of their home where these orcas and their society have co-evolved with the salmon they rely on and the web of life around them, including the sea stars. Well, the day is here. The long-awaited film, Coextinction, has premiered here on San Juan Island in the core critical summer habitat of the southern resident killer whales. And we're joined by the people who have made it happen, as well as Cy and Snow, who are great advocates of the film and appear in it. And if that wasn't enough, we're so pleased to have the honor of showing their new film, Project Sea Star. So some introductions of tonight's panelists. We've got uh, co-producer and director Gloria Pencrazi is a Canadian documentary filmmaker of environmental and indigenous justice documentaries. After witnessing firsthand the impending extinction of the southern resident orcas, she decided to take the matter into her own hands and create Coextinction, a documentary that would educate and inspire people worldwide to take action. Gloria has known she would spend the rest of her life working with the orca when she first saw orcas uh, for the first time off the coast of British Columbia at age 10. Uh, Cy Scammell is the co-producer uh, and director of Project Sea Star. Uh, Cy and Snow have co-founded uh, PNW Protectors, which is dedicated to protecting the southern resident orcas, bigs orcas, wild salmon, and kelp forests of the Salish Sea. They believe in working together like a pod to spread awareness through education, free diving, and art to empower daily actions for everyone worldwide to protect what we all love together, thin to thin. And our guest panelists from Coextinction are uh, Jim Waddell, who is a retired Army Corps civil engineer. He's the founder of damnsense.org and he's a PUD commissioner. Uh, Jim spoke at an Elwa dams meeting on the Olympic Peninsula prior to those dams' successful removal, garnering support and encouragement from Patagonia and salmon advocates to lend his knowledge to sensible hydro dam conversations. Uh, Will George joins us from a little north of here. Will is a land defender and leader in the resistance against the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion. I'm going to pass it to Will, but first, I didn't get the opportunity of getting uh, Jason Hoden's bio. So Jason, could you give us just a, a little quick self bio? Sure. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here with everybody. Uh, yeah, Jason Hoden, I'm you know, about uh, just across the water here in Friday Harbor Labs from where the film is being shown. and. Uh, I'm a marine biologist and I study sea stars and I'm working on the popular rearing program here, raising uh, and trying to figure out how to raise the, um, and do the full life cycle of the endangered sunflower star that uh, you may have seen about in the Sport film. So, yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you, Jason. Okay, uh, we're going to Will, um, could you please? Uh, start us off tonight with any thoughts and feelings that you happen to have tonight um, or about the story that Gloria and Elena have brought us. Sure. Um, very good. Um, I'm glad uh, I enjoyed the film. I know we spoke briefly, you know, did, uh, did anybody cry? And yes, it is uh, a lot of, a lot of trigger for some of us people and, and the, the amount of coverage that that and the, the whole co-extinction team covered and yeah you know with no restrictions they went forward and they really explain it what the the true threat is to the southern regs and orgas to to our life 
stocks, the wild salmon. I mean, these are species that are uh, over four million old, and so I'm uh, always so grateful to to be um, be a part of that that family of friendship that provided with her with her efforts in this film. It's a, it's a really incredible film, and, and it it uh, um, it just it just covers so much, and it makes it very simple what the threat is and how we can fix it as well. So uh, I'm pleased to be here with, with Jim and, uh, and all his hard work and his efforts as well as everybody else in this film of, of uh, how they captured and are all of our stories um, together in such a beautiful, incredible film. So uh, I could uh, feel that with you right now. So very grateful for the coke and um, it, it's the people need this, this messaging. People need to see this and uh, so yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, really grateful. Thank you, Will. Yeah. Gloria, do you want to have a word and just have a feeling tonight and you know that your film is premiering all over the place? And how does it feel? Yeah, it's always, I mean, like you said, well, it's always a whirlwind of emotion watching it. It's always a different part of it that gets me. And especially tonight, watching it here, which is such a powerful hub and home to all the issues and science snow who were a big part of making this film happen so and you went through a lot of you know everything that happened with Jake 50 we were all you know living it together so yeah a lot of emotions always a lot of gratitude to everyone who helped make this film happen who believed in us supported us and everyone who's watching it now today and who's being brought into the fight because it's so needed. We need more allies, we need more people taking action. So very grateful for everyone here tonight listening. Thanks, Gloria. So let's hear it. You've been, you've been a strong advocate uh, for the Southern residents, for Sea Stars, for co right, um, right. You know, how, how do you feel about the film coming out and what are your so, thoughts? So, so much pride all the way through uh, to met them years ago and uh, to know that they're coming through and uh, taking them underwater in the sail sea to kind of show them the environment um, and just kind of introduce some people and going to some of those events that are in the movie and, and put them on. It was just, we knew it was going to be an extraordinary movie and still the co-extinction just blew our mind <clears throat> even better than we thought it could be. It was absolutely incredible. Uh, fun fact, we were just laughing at this. Uh, she was in our movie, and we were in her, in her movie <laughs> for a full section. Uh, the first boy's hood on. <laughs> she was pointing out it was an overstar, if I remember correctly. Uh, but yeah, it's been a journey. I mean, it's not just making the movie. I mean, they were all conservationists as well, and so every day we're showing up and coming up with ideas and uh, you know, calling the, the politicians or anything to the north of us. Thanks, so. so before you know, jumping into the house, um, you know, I do want to bring attention to this perfect blend of films and speakers that we have tonight uh, to talk about just how interwoven the Southern residents' predicament is with such a vast range of humanity's footprint and activities and mindset. And that in the midst of this untenable and heartbreaking situation for the southern residents of the salmon and other species, do we also have the ingredients for us in the Salish Sea and in the Northwest to become a leader for solution to energize the world, to unlock some possibilities and accomplish what might feel impossible? What do we have going on in that department that might not exist elsewhere? Um, I didn't pick who would go first, but who's feeling brave? That's a big question. <laughs> Will? <laughs> it's, uh, it, the Southern resident predicament is tied into so many things, and yet they're so well loved around the world. Um, and maybe maybe it's a two-edged sword, <laughs> right? You know. Yeah. So, Jim, you've probably turned over that rock and thought about it. Um. 
Yeah, I, I guess I had a hard time following your commentary and question, but I, I, I think it had to do with uh, our human relationship with the orcas and so forth. And, um, you know, I got when I got involved with this so six or seven years ago um, and went to San Juan and first experienced the orcas, I was deeply moved. Um, so much so that I had a hard time uh, actually even uh, talking about it on film. And several of you guys, including Gloria, has got some footage of me that I'm, I'm glad you didn't show because I, I, I'm, I'm very emotional when it comes to the loss and tragedy of these uh, these incredible creatures. And it just uh, it 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 is an engineer. I, I'm you know people say, well, well how can you be so? Um, be that way emotional about it, but, uh, and I hide it, but um, it's true. And underneath it all, that's, that to me is uh, one of the most incredible tragedies here. What we're doing to a creature that is so intelligent, the emotional intelligence, it's just so powerful. It's so overwhelming compared even to humans. And, and yet we we're destroying them. And at a time when we've got all the resources in the world to save them rather easily. And so um, that's kind of my, sort of just an emotional view or what I take on uh, on the orcas of, uh, at this point. Well, that's a good summary. We do have what it takes to save them. So what are we missing? All that then, mm -hmm. a little bit. Uh, we got into this work after J52 died, Sonic, um, and we were just, you know, fun loving. Uh, fun loving free divers just enjoyed being underwater. We had no intention of you know diving into the conservation world, uh, and then it was just one worker after another just kept dying and kept dying. And we're like, what in the world is going on? So, I think the the essence of the question is, you know, what is the problem? Why is this still happening? We have organizations like NOAA and fantastic other organizations in science that are all saying the same thing. Uh, Jim Waddell's crew and uh, Center for Well Research, all saying the same thing. So, you know, what was missing? Obviously, they're, they're feeding the information to the politicians, good science, but yet nothing changed. Uh, and Abraham Lincoln says something to this effect, but basically, without the public's opinion, nothing can happen. You know, with the public's opinion, everything can happen. It's, I don't have it perfectly said there, obviously, but the public. That, that's what was missing in all this. There needed to be that a link between the scientists to inform the public and the public to use their influence and political pressure to the politicians to actually make good change and make good decisions uh, that their people wanted from them. And so that, that's kind of where all this started. And I think that's where a lot of the movement and making positive change has always come from is the, the movement of the people. So. There you go. That's a blank answer. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's a big uh, one more thing. I definitely feel like because you were like, can we be leaders in this? And I think that, again, the solutions are here. What we have to do is here, but our leaders are not the people that are in, in power are not decisions. And I think it's up to everyone to go and take action, take bold action to create systemic change. And so like, I do think we can create this change. It's not too late. It's just about really truly coming together and, and showing up really, you know, like full on show up, not just do a little thing here and there. Every single day, do everything in your power, you know? Well, Will George might know a thing or two about that, huh? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, I mean, yeah, if things like this film, I mean, these are the tools we choose to use to get messages out there and this is such a message with showing the orcas and if we could in touch the hearts of the people with films like this and, and showing them the amount of, of communications that orcas have between each other and the emotions that they're mammals and they um, have such communication where you know a mother will lay on her side and, and lay dead and lay around for just enough time for a seagull to land on it and that the baby orca will eat that seal that that takes huge communication and um, people not aware of that they think they're just another whale maybe or um, you know a killer whale and they just know it as what's in or it has been at sea world and in places like that um, so continually that these are actual mammals and they have communications and they have ceremonies as like 
when they, you know, they, it's very unusual for um, the mother to push her calf around, really communicating, not with just her own self, but her surroundings as well. Like, whatever she thinks those tanker traffics are, these people on these boats, she's communicating to all of us by doing these such um, such acts as that. So for me, it is um, getting that awareness out there and touching the hearts of the people that these are uh, incredible species that we need that are are on the edge of being is extinct. So um, again, just getting that awareness out there is is kind of what uh, what is more needed at this point. Um, yeah. The other, um, let me uh, uh, make an observation. You know about this activism that uh, Gloria mentioned and Will. Uh, you know when. Gloria started making this film, you know, I said, you know, one of the key things you can do in making the film is actually become an activist in the effort um, and be a part of the activism. And I was really surprised because she did that. And, you know, she organized a march up to Columbia um, uh, Gorge until it got stopped by the pandemic, brought a lot of attention to the issue. But that was a great example of, of you know, really get into the activism mode, which we have to have a lot more of. And she even, you know, um, organized a, a, a two-day protest at one of the trade associations there in Portland, and that really got their attention. That 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 trade organization had never been touched like that before. And um, as ugly as it was for some of us, you know, like myself, being a PUD commissioner, which, by the way, I don't represent the PUD in any of these comments I'm making. Um, you know, it 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 really woke them up. Of course, now you've stirred up a, a sleeping giant here, but that's okay. It, it's what we need to do. We just need to do more of it. So um, just uh, go ahead. Right. Thanks, Jim. You know, I'm going to just take this opportunity to dive into a little bit of your career and, you know, why you're here. So you're, you're an authoritative voice speaking about retiring federal infrastructure. So let's let's get an understanding of your career and your qualifications. Uh, so over the course of you know a pretty impressive Army Corps career, you've led policy and sustainable development within the EPA and National Science Foundation. You were a science advisor to the President of the United States as a senior policy analyst for the environment in the White House Office of Science and Technology. Your efforts in 1989 helped establish and organize the U.S. Global Change Research Program. In 1999, you became the, the deputy district engineer for programs in the Walla Walla District when a $33 million lower snake feasibility study was in its fifth year. So this was the most comprehensive effort ever undertaken, it's according to your, your website, the most comprehensive effort ever undertaken by any government to determine the feasibility of breaching dams to restore salmon runs. But your recommendations to breach the dams based on study and input from over 100,000 commenters was ignored. But you've carried on for the sake of species and responsible use of taxpayer dollars. Uh, but can you briefly talk about, you know, where you come from in your career? For instance, your national security work in the White House uh, on the Army Corps infrastructure impacts to the environment. You know, I mean, you're talking about retiring major federal infrastructure. So, you know, what's your background uh, to just let the audience a glimpse of that? If I didn't already come. Thanks for that rundown on my resume. I didn't realize I I forgot I did all that stuff. Um, I, I think it's really one of the what makes me really unique here is a couple things. Uh, one, when I was in Washington, D.C., I undertook policy studies to figure out what the true authorities of the Corps of Engineers were and how they how these projects that we were about to build or had already built and were operating um, were what what they what they really meant in law were they mandated or not and that kind of thing and what what it was 
you know, and my job was to sort that out. And what became clear to me was, I'll turn the light on in a minute. I got a timer on this thing for some reason. But anyway, um, the, um, the, the bottom line is a really key point here is the Corps of Engineers has all the authority in the world to breach these dams on, on a moment's notice, basically. They can do that. They do it. Um, they've done it all the time. And um, they don't need Congress to authorize anything. And this is one of the greatest myths that has been perpetuated in the Northwest by the politicians, by the agencies, by Bonneville Power Administration, the pro-dam um, groups and lobbyists and trade groups, even environmental groups still insist that they have to get Congress to authorize something. And this is absolutely not true. Um, also, being the deputy district engineer in Walla Walla gave me firsthand experience on the, in the major five or six major dams on the Snake and Columbia Rivers. And we were working on this feasibility study back 20 years ago, big one, 33 million. And we uncovered, I mean, we, we looked under every rock in the world to try to figure out what to. And in the end, if anybody bothered to really read the report, it was very clear that the, um, the best solution by far for recovering salmon is uh, breaching lower snake dams and, and basically concluded that we concluded that if you did anything more on the dams, it's worse than doing nothing. And unfortunately, that, that information in that report was ignored and it just basically became a, a political decision that, oh no, we're gonna keep the dams. So um, uh, that's another key point that is, is, it, it's important in terms of my background that I bring to this. Um, but oddly, you know, I'm constantly shot down by people that um, don't have that kind of experience that basically say, oh, we got to get Congress to do this and so forth. And, and I'm telling you, it's not needed. And even if you thought it was, it would take decades to get Congress to do an authorization to breach a dam. Um, so those are a couple key points uh, about the, um, my relevancy to and background here. Um, there are plenty of others. Um, you know, dam census we was basically set up um, by a handful of people that started off as uh, um, myself and other Corps of Engineer employees. Some of them were active duty, some retired, and we began assembling information and putting it out there. And so, my job has basically been to convey data, government information to the public and to the policyholders and anybody that I can possibly get it to, and point out that the government's own data, whether you're talking about salmon whether you're talking about orcas or hydropower or navigation, those dams, whatever it is, it all points to the same thing. The government data clearly shows these dams are a waste of money and they, they are, there's no way you can have those dams and, and reservoirs and maintain salmon or, or recover salmon at all. And without salmon uh, recovery, you're not going to save these orcas. And in fact, one of the other most interesting things about this uh, breaching is actually the quickest way by far to increase the amount of adult salmon available to orcas and fishermen. And it can be, when you breach, you stop the death of 10 million juvenile smolt, uh, Chinook smolts. Those 10 million that are saved, some will die on the way to the rest of the dams or going through the rest of the dams and get into the ocean, but a lot of them will be out there to feed orcas and, and fishermen. So, there's, a, there's another, a lot of other mythology floating around here that, uh, you know, breaching really won't provide that many fish anytime soon. So those are three points and they um, and we can get into some more of this, but um, I just I'll answer your question with those three points at this time. Well, thanks, Jim. Uh, I always wonder if there were a dam proponent here sitting at the table, what would there be res their response be to what you're telling us? <laughs> they they don't they don't have real responses. Um, the um, you know I, I guess I hear all kind of crazy stuff. Uh, oh well, I, you know I've been told uh, by other commissioners. Oh well, uh, we don't believe the Corps of Engineers or we don't believe BPA. And it's like, well, wait a minute, you believe them when they when they talk about how good the dams are, but you don't believe them when their data says the dams are losing money. So. It, 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 it really is a silly argument to talk to a lot of these people and most of them stay out of my way. They, they, they know that, uh, I, you know, <laughs> I've got all this information and it's not, I'm not making this stuff up. I can cite where it's coming from, provide the raw data, provide the reports, whatever. So it, it, um, it, uh, it, it's really, 
um, an, an, uh, just a crazy issue, a crazy debate to have um, because the opposition is just loaded with propaganda and, um, and they don't mind making up stuff or cherry picking information from NOAA or EPA or the Corps or anybody, BPA. Okay, so before I move on to other guests, just to you know, make sure we cover this enough, uh, one of the things that, that might come up is um, politicians, uh, other leaders, damn proponents, do like to say that we absolutely do rely on the power from the Snake River dams and if, if we were to retire those dams, that power would need to be replaced. And I guess the question is, where is the, uh, the source of data uh, as the basis for that statement? I mean, it's a, it's a bold thing to say to the entire public and ratepayers that we absolutely rely on that generation resource. So if, if that's being said, what is the basis of it? And is, is that problematic? Well, yeah, that's another myth perpetuated by trade groups for dams and pro-dam folks and basically any, anybody that's anti-environmental. Um, we've looked into that at great length. What is the basis of their information? And what we continually find is years ago, somebody said, oh, well, let's make, you know, we come up with this number of 100 or $500 million value for um, keeping uh, or for replacing the hydropower. And we, we can't find any real basis. There's no generation data to support that. There's no um, calculus or, or math. I mean, any, there's nothing really there. When we go back and look at what the core did and what they said 20 years ago, what we said was there was, there was a very small amount of value um, that could be attributed to like peaking power. Whereas uh, pro dam proponents say there's five hundred million dollars worth, and there really there's n virtually none, and so um, the, you know what what they present as data is is not it's not data, the generation data actually shows that there's and and BA um, has said it many times there's surplus energy in the system, um, that's how they make a lot of their money, but when prices are low they lose money, and that's what they've been doing for uh, many years now. And the Snake River dams being the most expensive of the major dams are the biggest losers here. They lose money, you know, even when the other dams are making money. And somebody asked the question there in a the chat, are all dams not needed? Of course not. Uh, the, there are plenty of dams, uh, particularly in the Columbia Basin, that are going to, the hydropower is important. We're going to need it. And um, the, um, uh, the, uh, 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 well, I lost my train of thought there. The, um, but it's it's just simply um, a clear case that the uh, oh uh, I know it's saying the Northwest Power and Conservation Council has, in their recent modeling of two years worth of analytical work very well done has pointed out there is basically a glut of power uh, in the in the system in the Northwest and a lot of it has to do with hydropower and so Snake River Dam um, power is is basically all surplus. And um, other folks, uh, there's another group that's looked into the energy situation and put out a report a few years ago that said, oh, well, we think we can replace hydropower for $500 million a year using solar. Well, you don't need to, A. B, it doesn't cost that much even if you did have to replace it. So it, it's, it's just, um, there's really, uh, people aren't looking at generation data, the price of power, and also what the current price and where solar, wind, and batteries are, are headed. But all this stuff is reinforcing the simple argument, you don't need to replace this power. So basically, you're telling us that we are letting salmon and the southern residents go extinct for, for essentially no good reason. Say that again. I, I, I missed it. Was that a question to me? Uh, no, I'm just wrapping up uh, your statement. It sounds as though, um, from what we're hearing from you, is that we are allowing salmon and uh, a very large portion of the southern residents' prey uh, affecting the southern residents, letting them go extinct unnecessarily. Yeah, that's true. And I noticed that somebody um, points out that Eco Northwest did a study a few years ago that 20% of salmon would 
it would only be a 20% increase. Um, those numbers are based on some old modeling. Um, there's a lot of question about that data, but here's the key point that, that a lot of these models are missing. 20 million sh juvenile Chinook go down the lower Snake River every year. The dams and reservoirs, especially, have a mortality rate close to 50%. So do the math. If you don't have those dams there and those reservoirs there with all their predators and hot water and dissolved gas, that's 10 million juvenile Chinook that don't die. Now, you can you can come up with any kind of percentage you want. I, it's you know the thing about percentages you get you, a percentage of what, when, and where. And so a lot of times when they say you see a number like twenty percent, oh well, they mean all the way back to Idaho. Well, what about out in the ocean? Um, you know what does it do for fish out in the ocean? Because you got to remember these salmon are feeding not only orcas but a lot of other. Um, uh, uh, fish as they uh, when they're small and of course they're part of the fisheries for tribes and commercial fishermen and so forth and so um, it's easy to come up with percentages and numbers and stuff but um, I like to keep the keep it simple you know I'm just an engineer so let's just stick with some of the simple stuff like you save 10 million juvenile Chinook every year when you breach the dams that's a lot of fish and that's a lot more than the orcas need and, and as well as our fisheries. Well, thanks, Jim. Appreciate that, that concise rundown. Well, you know, that, that makes me wonder. Let's go to, to Jason. Um, you know, you guys have been inside. You guys have been working on uh, bringing the sea stars back. And that's also tied in with salmon. Do you want to do you want to connect the dots between what Jim was just talking about and, and your project? Sure. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, we just started noticing a uh, heavily reduction in kelp forest because we're in the water all the time, and we just started asking a lot of questions. And um, we're dear friends with Joe Gatos, uh, the chief scientist for the Sea Dog Society. He connected us with Jason, saying he's got an awesome sea star. Uh, program, so far, to start program going at the labs, um, and so I started connecting the dots, and he explained uh, basically the, the different things that were going on and what he was working on. Uh, but yeah, I'll let Jason explain. He's going to be able to tell it much better than I will. All right, you're up, Jason. Okay. Well, yeah. Thanks. Uh, so, yeah, the the connections run very very deep. Um, let me let me just give you one example. We are um, in our program, we are trying to figure out for the first time how to raise the very, very tiny juvenile stages of the sea star. This is after they go through the beginning of their life cycle as a swimming microscopic larva. Then they land down onto the seafloor as a tiny, tiny juvenile at stages that are impossible to find in the wild and we knew literally nothing about. And then eventually they grow up into the largest sea star on the planet. So a lot happens between something that starts out at a size you can barely see to when they become these giant sea stars as adults. And you know, just to follow up with the conversation we were just having about juvenile salmon, it's the same thing with the sea stars. They're, they're not, they don't just appear suddenly at this large stage and only function in the ecosystem at that point. Every stage in between is important in ways we didn't understand. So as the film pointed out, uh, we, we do know that sunflower stars are predators of sea urchins. And when sea urchins, totally fine species, but when they're, when they're not kept in check by their predators, which are sunflower stars and historically sea otters, which have been hunted to extinction along much of the West Coast, when you take out too many of the predators, then the uh, a species that's fine starts to populate out of control and their, their food source, the kelp, goes down and kelp forests are basically the fundamental nature of the entire west coast oceanic ecosystem so connected to juvenile habitat for fish um, the things that salmon themselves eat um, so all of these things are, are are intimately connected with one another and just to sort of like complete the the point of what we're doing and what little part we can we can uh you know sort of have in this in you know trying to resolve these issues is that 
you know, again, back to these juveniles, these tiny little sea stars, we've been able to rear them and see what they eat. And what do they eat? They eat sea urchins at little tiny sea urchins. So it's not just the adult sea stars eating the large sea urchins. At these small stages, the tiny juveniles are eating tiny sea urchins. And you know what? They actually eat a lot more per day than an adult sunflower star can. So, you know, um, just like these numbers of 10 million uh, juvenile salmon coming downstream, you got to think about this in a very broad perspective. You take out a species from the ecosystem and, you know, you find out all these cascading effects that, um, uh, you know, we're really interested in as scientists, but we'd rather not find out that way. We'd rather, you know, sort of maintain the ecosystems as they are, restore them to the state that they were. And, you know, studying them in the slow, uh, determined process of scientists really like yeah, they, I keep hearing that it's much better not to destroy a place than to try and fix it. Um, there's a lot of unknowns, so maybe we need more people like Will and Gloria out there kind of just standing in the way of things. What do you think, Will? I mean, you seem to maybe you just have this something in your core or your heart where you, you see something happening that you know shouldn't be happening and you, you spring to action. Uh, and yet you're not a scientist. You don't have some type of uh, scientific or research-based evidence that what you're you know, trying to prevent happen is happening. How do you know that you need to do what you are doing? How do you know that? Um, yeah, I asked myself that same question too. I mean, it really comes naturally. Um, you know, it wasn't that long ago that, you know, our way of life was, was colonized. Uh, it's still in our blood and our DNA. Like where I'm from, where I live right now on my reservation here, we we're never relocated. Like it happened far throughout, you know, the history of, um, history of North America and what happened to indigenous people here were never relocated uh so this very body of water that's threatened with the the traffic of, from the the trans mountain expansion um will increase it by 700 percent i mean um 90 percent of our body of water um so it's just again it's just a natural thing to to protect that for you know to honor my ancestors that you know that it, for thousands and thousands of years, my people thrived off this this very body of water that I'm, I'm fighting so hard to protect. So um, it's just who we are, and it's what we're to do. It, it's in our culture to be stewards of these lands, to to caretake for them in such a way. But um, it, it's you know, it, it didn't take long. You know, you look at salmon; it's a keynote species, and you know what what a keynote species is, and people really look into it, what it what it does. And, you know, there's fossil bones that are milled and it, it took about even 70 years to wipe up the largest, you know, um, salmon stocks in, in the whole world on this west coast. Um, it, it didn't take that long to wipe it up. Uh, so it, it's just been our way of life um, to stand up for, for the future generations as well. Um, you know, I just recently um, was charged and convicted for um, for standing up my lands and waters and uh, you know for me it's okay like you know um they want to give me some jail time uh, but what really affects me the most is is knowing that it's it's almost becoming impossible to protect this this way of life that we that, that my ancestors were they're thrown out of windows driven over by vehicles to hold on to this knowledge that has passed down to us for centuries we don't have a written history written documents it was all verbal and it's how you felt how the old ones would teach you. You remember those feelings of those words of how you felt and and then when you when you have those emotions and the, the unique vibration that we all have, that's you know where a lot of strength comes from. Right. What can we do um, to help to to support First Nations? Um, what can people do cross border? Yeah, and I mean, I don't know. It, it's it's. I've never really asked for help. You know, I've kind of. Um, but, but like folks like Coke Station, I mean, you know, you want to be an ally um, for my experience and people that want to help. Um, 
it's uh it's you gotta be don't put stress onto the the person the host nation that you're there. You, you're there to support and do what's asked kind of i mean um there's so many ways we could fight this i mean um it, it gets impossible feeling too f because this expansion is at such a low percent right now. There's no demand for this oil. There's no reason why our government is, is paying over $20 billion of taxpayer dollars. There's no demand for it. So to me, it feels like, you know, we're there's someone else behind it. We're fighting globalists. Why, why is this oil need to be extracted out here at, the, at this volume and at such a risk where it's mixed with, with Looted bitumen, heated up through to get through this pipeline. Um, bitumen, it, it sinks to the bottom. Not a lot of people know that that you can't recover bitumen once it enters the water system. Um, so um, ways you can help is, is continue in these out there that um, um, you know in our city limits. You look at people uh having cocktails after work they have no idea what's coming this way They're, they don't know they just think oh there's an indigenous problem again in the news um we look like we're, we're a cost we're a burden but um we're still very nice people going into this but when you start thinking that you're you're facing globalists it becomes um really daunting uh really hard to uh to want to continue but uh for people that want to support is is um is having um just caring for the the um the awareness i mean and it's very good information in this video and it's all readily available but it's that much so more awareness for the people is, is how we can all help well how about a a legal team who's your legal team you know in fact just a couple days ago there was an article that came out of a canadian news outlet about a or no it was in the narwhal uh, about a very, very seasoned uh, environmental attorney who has developed a lot of strategy over the decades, uh, long-term strategy. Yeah. But, you know, we're talking about the, the, the pipeline here and the 700-fold increase in oil traffic. And you're standing in the way. And, I mean, you know, can we stand up and figure out a way to get you some support from a yeah. decent attorney and do something meaningful? I mean, um, my nation, uh, they spend a lot of millions of dollars on this. We have 1,200 page assessment that, you know, the, um, they didn't look at our assessments. They didn't look at our documents and all their team of lawyers and all their millions of dollars and 11 years of court can't stop it. Um, what is going to stop it? You know what I mean? Um, so it, it's a little defeating at times, but. I mean, we can't give up. We can't stop. We gotta keep going forward. But um, I mean, that's kind of where I'm at. But it's, it's um, everything's needed. You know, we all have our gifts. Like you, you know, you mentioned. Uh, I'm not a scientist. I mean, um, <laughs> um, or anything. But all of our gifts all come together. Like look at this panel. Look at the glory it has. That Jim has, and you know, the awareness of the starfish. And you know, it just trickles when you take one species um, again. So it's. Uh, more awareness, more films like this, and, and, and touching the hearts of the people is, uh, it, it takes all, all of us, all hands in together to, to create change, you know, and hopefully it's not too late, you know, we got to look to our younger generation to, to pick up these, people. hopefully they have us to, to pick up, to, to restore these salmon stock, to, to hang on to these other resident orcas, so, um, the way too is so I have great hope in the, the next generation to come. You know, they're they're educating themselves. They're concerned. This is their world too. You know, it's not just an, an indigenous problem. This is an everybody problem. To have this much um, oil being extracted out of here and then to continue going, polluting the rest of the earth. I mean, um, I got Jim lives. You guys, we all live on the west coast here. We know the tricky navigation filterings and especially around san juan i can't remember what area it is but they're proposing to have four different tugs to help because these tankers are uh a larger class uh, of vessel they're really, really bigger so what they want is four tugs to help them make this navigate these these tricky turns in the sailor seas and um 
when you're looking at uh, us, um, there's probably what well, there's a skipper and then there's um you know probably four guys in each vessel. You look at what well, sixteen people trying to make these turns and then that those people are gonna get worn out. I mean those six there's not a lot of people that can that can hold those positions and, and, and help make that so keep happens, mechanical illness for me to and for all of us to continue um all these threats of the these poor orcas face is the low stamina stock so they can't even hear them because of the, the increased tanker traffic noise so um it is a lot they all, all have to do but um you know it's um yeah. it sounds like jim knows the struggle all too well i mean when you're you know facing politicians or um they always have an answer or they don't have an answer and they pull, but they can't fix it so um, it, it could be very frustrating for sure. Yeah, thanks, Will. Um, you know, that, that leads me to, um, well, one thing, let's not forget what happened to the, uh, the Alaskan orcas who are now functionally extinct after the Exxon Valdez spill. Yeah. So we should keep that in mind in the Sailor Sea. Uh, very sad story. Um, but in terms of politics, um, Jim, political leaders continue responding to the public's concern about the dams by creating studies and collaborations. So, you know, is this a new response or is it a decades old pattern? And what are these studies and collaborations actually producing? Um, what does the public need to know about that? If you could just give us a quick snapshot of really what the politician's response is, and then I'm going to go to Sai because he's got some really cool instructables on how people can contact their their, their officials. But you know, what what does the public need to understand about what politicians' response is to this issue? Well, they need to first realize that any discussion about more studies about the need to authorization for breaching, the need to deauthorize the dams, you don't need to do that to breach them. You can put them in a non-operational status. The Corps can do that overnight. They don't need anybody. Um, the, uh, the, the many people that work, that are collaborating with the politician have made all kinds of deals and arrangements that um, fit their agenda and purpose. And um, they all have a common element. They perpetuate the, the continuing process of study, litigate, study, litigate, more studies, more collaboration, more task force like the ORCA task force. Now we have the four governors process. Uh, Inslee and Murray are talking about um, doing, uh, put coming out in the next summer with a document or some kind of implement, you know, some ideas for, for breaching that will call for more studies, I'm sure. I, we, it just never ends. And so people have to get serious about the urgency of the situation. These orcas can't keep, they, they're starving now. They have been. They're, they're basically, you know, their, their ability to reproduce is just about gone. The salmon are in worse situation they've been in since the in the last 20 or 30 years, and yet you still have politicians saying, oh, well, things are trending better. Well, they find one creek someplace that did a little better than last year, and all of a sudden the whole basin is in recovery. It's not. It's wor it's as bad as it's ever been and getting worse. And then for ratepayers who are paying for the four snake dams that cost exorbitant, uh, a lot more than the Columbia dams, um, and they don't generate the kind of power that the claims are made. So um, they're getting... Um, abuse financially and all of the, the, the finances facing BPA um, are all going to come back to haunt us here very shortly in the next few years and we may be stuck with a whole lot of concrete out in that river it's not producing and it's going to come like uh, the nuclear power plants was a big bailout that ratepayers are still paying for so you got all this stuff that's real today and the public needs to wake up 
And to do something, you have to go after the president of the United States. The, the administration in Washington is the only people that are going to solve this. This is not going to be solved in the Northwest by any politicians that, that I see. Uh, and there aren't any groups out here that really um, uh, are capable of changing the attitudes in the Northwest. The public has to reach to Biden, the president of the United States and those agency heads like Secretary of Energy and NOAA and so forth like that and communicate directly. Um, that's what we've done. We've, we've written letters to Biden and saying we need you to breach right away and you're the only guy that can do it. And the reason he needs to do it is because he can tell the Corps of Engineers to do it. and They've got to do it at that point. Um, the Corps could do it, but the regional guys aren't going to do it. And so it's going to take that Washington leadership and only the public can influence that. Uh, well, I mean, I wouldn't say only, but you ask what the public can do and they can play a big role in that, of course. The rest of us, the tribes, the you know, environmental groups can do the same thing. Got it. Thanks, Jim. Well, I know that um, PNW Protector is here. Uh, you guys probably have a good web page where people can go um, to yeah. learn about what to do and probably coordinate with Jim. We or do, what's yeah. Up there. We talk to Jim. We talk to Coextinction, Sea Doc Society, uh, Wild Orca. I mean, we. We try to be the bridge uh, between all the organizations, the scientists, and just bring to the public. And exactly what Jim's saying is, is exactly what we're always trying to do is get the public the information and to activate them with that information so they know what they, they need to do. I mean, that's, that's the problem that we've noticed. Um, so yeah, we don't, we don't pretend to be the scientists and we don't pretend to be the attorneys and bring people to court. We just want to get the public the power uh, to be able to go to these politicians. And so, yeah, we have a list of the names and numbers, what to say, everything on pnwprotectors.com. Uh, and on social media, we keep everybody up to date with the, the newest information of the events and articles and what people can do about it. I mean, that's, that's the whole point, is to make sure that they have the power to do something. Okay, that was... Yep. Um, Heather, one other quick point. Uh, Congressman Simpson, as you know, put out a plan that's been talked about here in the chat box. $33 billion to take care of this problem. You don't need $33 billion. You don't need $3 billion. You don't even need a billion. All the mitigation, all the breaching can be done for $750 million. And that's based off Corps of Engineers cost data that I've worked on and other folks from the Corps. But it's in the, it's in the 2002 EIS. Those cost numbers are the basis for what I just said. And so um, that's another, um, you know, it, poison pill to say that something's going to cost $30 billion, forget it. You know, you're not going to get that kind of money, um, you know, infrastructure bill or not. They're not, they just don't throw money around like that. Okay. Uh, and also I'd like to just say to the audience, uh, because of our technical setup tonight, I'm not able to reach over to the computer and look at the Q and A. So we've got to probably end it relatively, I wish I could. Um, we should probably think about wrapping up because Gloria has been on the road premiering this film and probably needs some rest, but I do. Oh, I first wanted to say that uh, Sai's website is pnwprotectors.org. Oh, excuse me, <laughs> pnwprotectors.com. There you go. And any questions, feel free to just reach out to us. We'll answer you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, so much for your time tonight. You got to say a few words, um, just a little. And also, coextinctionfilm.com dash action. We'll have a lot of actions that you can take that everyone talked about tonight. So that and Peanut Protectors, great places for you to go and start taking action tonight, tomorrow. And yeah, just thank you, everyone. Yeah. And also, before our tech guy ends the, the Q&A, if any of you panelists want to put your, you know, your contact information uh, for the audience, since I do apologize that I haven't been able to check the questions, um, if anybody uh, wants to put in their contact info for the audience to ask them questions directly, please feel free. Um, size email is available at pnwprotectors.com, and likewise, um, you can contact the co-extinction team. So again, I really was looking forward to hearing from our audience, so <laughs> we'll have more opportunities.
Thank, thank you, Will. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Jason. You guys are bye, bye. And uh, yeah, listen, I, it's been a pleasure to meet you, Jason, and you, Will, and Jim. Um, thank you so much for the work that you're doing, you guys, for the work that you're doing. I know it's late yeah. and we're tired. We've had a long discussion, but I will, um, I'm energized. I'm really energized by your films and all of you for the just relentless, dedicated work that you do. Sometimes we feel tired, but there's really no choice but to move forward. And when we come together, I feel extremely energized. And I just want to thank all of you for coming and taking the time tonight and for the audience to join us. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, guys.